Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College. Today we're going to talk about the humble object pattern. Now this pattern is not in the game programming patterns book, but it is a pattern that I use pretty consistently through a lot of projects, especially ones where I need testing or the things are just getting big and a little bit harder to manage. So let's go through a simple example first and then I'll show you the code and then I'll show you how to start using this new pattern. So here we've got just a bird and I can move up and down as soon as I click in there, go up and down and it stops at certain limits. It's pretty much the entirety of my game right now. And here you'll see we've got a bird. It has a bird script with a min height and a max height. And then underneath it is just a model. This is just the chicken here, nothing special. So let's stop and take a look at the code. I'm gonna open up this bird script. And here you'll see nothing too special, nothing really complicated or anything like that. We have two serialized fields, a max and a min height, just three and negative three. That's how high and up or up and down we were going. In update, we get the vertical axis. So just up to arrow, down arrow, or up and down on a controller or something. And then uh, we call move and pass in that axis. We move the thing uh, upwards times the vertical. So if we have a positive on the vertical, which is like hitting the up, we'll have a one. We're just gonna add a one to the Y value, essentially. Up times one is up, basically. And then if we go negative, we'll go down, so we'll just be subtracting this and reducing it by one. So it's just jumping up an entire meter, basically, up or down as we hit the button. Then in here, line 19 through 22, this is the code that we're gonna be separating out soon. But if you take a look at it, you see it accesses the transform, just checks that the position is, if it's greater than the max height, then we reset it back down to the max height. If it's less than the min height right here, we reset the position back down to the min height. We keep the X and Z positions. We're just adjusting these just to clamp it right in there so that it can't go above or below. Now you might be thinking, why would I want to split this out or separate this? It's really simple and in this case it is and that's because I wanted to start with something really basic that's easy to understand I don't want to go into a real project that's full of very complicated and semi coupled code I want to go with something like this where you can just tell exactly what's going on here now but imagine this bird is doing a whole lot of other things and maybe there are other people working on this bird and somebody could theoretically screw up and break it now they may not break it in this way perhaps they did something as simple as oh that they put the arrow the wrong way and it's going to have some bad behavior and we may not know right away so if this is just a bird game where you control the bird and that's all you do you probably find out right away right you'll go to play the bird won't go in the right position you realize something's wrong and probably figure it out but if this bird is a small part of the game off on you know starting at level six or something the birds can randomly appear and maybe they move up and down or something something where it's not the core piece of the game you may miss this for a while in fact you may do an update change this break it and not even fully test it and push it out so how can we avoid that well an easy way to do that well, semi easy you'll see in a moment is to just add some unit tests so in a normal project, if it were not a game project, it would definitely be under test. And we'd have some tests passing in some vertical values to this move and moving the object and validating that the position is correct, that perhaps it stayed within the max height and the min height. Right? We'd do something like that where we'd move it up and down. Now we can do this with a mono behavior. It's just not very easy. It's a little bit complicated and a little bit slower to set up tests that run on mono behaviors, and we really don't need the mono behavior to test this code. If you think about it, this move code right here, well, this part right here, nothing special. We're just moving the position, but it's good to test that this actually increases or decreases the position in case somebody messed up, and again, you know, maybe they did that, put a division symbol there, or maybe they accidentally put a negative there. You know, mistakes happen all the time, and again, when the code base is bigger, and it's not this tiny little thing that fits in what is this, 24 lines, it's a lot easier to accidentally break things when you're changing one thing, something else breaks along with it. So how would we get something like this under test without doing full play mode tests? Well, to do that, we use this humble object pattern. And I'm gonna show you an example of that now. So we're gonna go into this bird split class. And let's take a quick look. In fact, let's pull these up side by side. 
there we go. So we've got our original bird and our new split out one. This is essentially our humble bird. First thing to notice, it has an interface here. This bird did not have an interface. Well, let's look at the interface. I'll just hit F12 on that. And you'll see that we have a position, capital P, a max height and a min height. These are all Pascal case. So we have an uppercase first letter because they're properties and that's generally the way they should be. And the position has a setter. The other two do not. So if we're using it as an iBird, we'll only be able to read these, but we'll be able to set the position. Let's go back into the bird. The bird also has a bird controller that we'll look at in just a moment. In fact, you may notice that move is missing because it's actually on that bird controller. And then we've got our serialized field and I've added a public property here to just return back that field so that we can implement this interface. And we've done the same thing for min height. We've got our min height as a private serialized field and a public property so that it can go onto our interface and our code in the bird controller can use it. In awake, we initialize this bird controller right here and we pass in this. So we're passing in this bird split mono behavior. And then in update, we still read the input the same. We say vertical equals input dot get access vertical. But then we call into the bird controller and say move and pass in this vertical value. So we're we're not just doing the math right here or moving it in here. We're doing it in the bird controller. Let's go look at the bird controller now. So just hold control, click on the bird controller. And here we are. Here, let's, uh, let's drag this over just a little bit. So it's a little easier to see all of the code there. Now our bird controller has a reference to an iBird. If you remember our bird split, this humble bird here has that interface right there. And then in our bird controllers constructor, we just cache that bird. So when we're calling in our bird split right here and passing this mono behavior in, it's actually just coming in as an iBird because bird controller expects an iBird. And then, uh, but I mean, it is the same object. We're just using it as an iBird, I should say. There, I didn't mean to click on bird test. Let's go back to the controller. So in the controller, we have that bird and then we have this move function. The move function incre increases the bird's position or you know, decreases it if our vertical is negative. Does the exact same checks, except now we're checking against these public properties instead of the fields because we don't have access to private fields in, through an interface. And then we're just setting the position again if it goes outside those ranges. This code right here, this entire bird controller, is completely testable now. So let's look at how we would set up the unit tests for this. Well, actually first, let's go into the game and play with this bird split and make sure that it works. So we'll dive in here and I've got a scene already set up, the humble bird. And here you'll see we have the exact same thing, just this bird split. Oh, and a bunch of extra junk that I left on here. Let's just clear that out. So I've got this bird split and underneath it is again, just that same chicken. So we'll hit play and I should be able to move up and down. Yep, there we go. And it's all working. Okay, now let's look at the tests. All right, so here's our bird test file. And here, it doesn't need to be a partial file. That was an accident, there we go. It's just a public class named bird tests and it also doesn't need to be a mono behavior. So let's get all that junk off there that doesn't need to be there. And here we have two methods. We have a bird stops at min height and a bird stops at max height. And we have this test attribute. That's important before I go any further, make sure that your test is in an editor folder or if you're using assembly definitions, make sure that you have it set up so that it can run. Here I've just dropped in an editor folder and put the bird test file right in it. So let's look at how these tests work. The first thing you'll notice here in this min height one is that we use a reference or an iBird named bird and I'm just creating a new mock bird. Now let's look at a mock bird real quick. This is just a very simple object that's implementing the iBird interface and it has a position, a max height, and a min height. That's it, nothing special at all. Now, if we were doing a full unit testing video, we could use something like nSubstitute and not need any of this. We could actually just have it give us a substitute or a mock of the bird or the iBird interface and we wouldn't need to worry about it. But since I don't wanna to dive too deep into that, we're just creating this new mock bird and setting the max height and the min height. Then we create the bird controller and we pass in this bird. Remember the bird controller just needs an iBird. It doesn't care if it's that mono behavior one that's moving around. It just needs to know that the thing has a position. It has a max height and a min height so that we can move it around. And it also, well, yeah, that's it. 
right? So we've got our bird controller. We've initialized it with our iBird. And then in our bird controller, I'm just calling move and passing in a negative 10. Remember this right here, this float vertical isn't necessarily a direction. It's actually the distance that I'm moving in that direction because we're not doing any time dot delta time scaling here. We could, of course, but we wouldn't want to do that in this move method in the bird controller because then, um, well, it would be referencing things like time dot delta time that we can't access in a unit test. We don't want to reference any of that stuff. So here, again, we just move up that position. So let's look again back at our test. Once we move it, we just do an assert and we want to say that these are equal. Negative three is the first parameter, that's the expected, and the bird's y position. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that, hey, I expect if I move it down 10, it's gonna to go to negative three and stop there. And I could write in another test. Let's say I would put in another test here, like bird, say moves up one meter. So if I just want the bird to move up one meter and I give it a positive one, and then I should be able to assert that the y position here is equal to one. So moving it up by one should make the bird's y position equal one. Very simple, but I'm again testing to make sure that there isn't an issue here. So let's see how this could break and how this could save us. So I've got the test in there. Let's go into the editor and I'm gonna to go to my test runner section. If you don't see that, it's just under window and I believe it's under general, there it is, and test runner. Oh, there we go, I've got another one. So let's just run all of the tests. You can see here I've got my three tests. If I hit run all, they should all pass. Yep, and they did. They all did exactly what they were expected to do. Let's drop this over here and dock it. And now I'm gonna go back into the code and see a situation where, like I said, it could actually save us and prevent us from making mistakes. So let's go into our bird test and let's go into move. And again, just imagine this is a larger project where the code's not super simple and in this bird controller, somebody messed up, refactoring the code, changing it, maybe even first time writing it, and put min height there instead. So now it should say if the height is greater than min height, it's gonna fly up to max. Well, let's see, let's go play. Go into the editor and we'll hit run all. And now you see that we're getting an error because a mistake was made, the unit test is able to catch it, and you'll see that the expected value was one, but we got three. Then we could go back into our code. Now, maybe this happens after a commit, we do a build automatically, we get some failure notices that, hey, a test failed, go check it out. Ideally, it happens before we commit, we run the tests and then commit, or in some commit hook, but even then, I'd rather catch it on an automated build than in production here. So we'd go, hey, oh yeah, this is wrong. This should be max height. Because if it's greater than min height, we don't want to knock it up to max height. That'd be like, it's greater than negative three, pop it up. So we just change this back to max height. Now, this pattern is really useful for unit testing. I mentioned that, and I think I showed an example here of how it can really help with that. But it's not just unit testing where this really comes in handy. This whole pattern of separating out your code, using some interfaces and avoiding mono behaviors where it makes sense, not putting all of your code directly into a mono behavior. It helps a lot with, I'd say, larger projects where you have a lot of systems that need to tie together and you don't want it all to be well, in mono behaviors because it gets to be kind of messy and hard to deal with. If I have interfaces like this, like our iBird, it's a whole lot easier for me to just code against that interface and then not worry about whether it's a mono behavior or something else. I can mock that out with something like my crappy mock that you saw a minute ago, or again, and substitute, put that all into unit tests. But I can also swap things out. So if I wanna have a different bird, I don't want necessarily this bird split. Maybe I need some network version of this bird that's not a mono behavior that's working with my networking system, or there's some other reason that I need to just swap this out, perhaps for a different platform, or some other use case. There are a lot of things I can think of in bigger projects that I've done uh, where this really helps and being able to pass around an interface that doesn't necessarily need to be on mono behavior makes a big difference. And again, 
unit testing can make a huge difference and this can really help split that out, separate everything away from that mono behavior and just make it easy and clean. All right, thanks for joining me for this. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, share with all your friends and that stuff and have a great day.